Good morning. Our scripture this morning is found in the book of James, the first chapter, verses 5 through 11, and I'm going to be reading from the new King, King James Version of the Bible. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, it flower, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes." so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. If you've been listening to North Fork Sunday Sermons on YouTube, you know that we're in a series on the New Testament book of James, one of the earliest and one of the most practical books in the entire New Testament. It was written by Jesus' half-brother, James, who became the leader of the Jerusalem church. And it was written primarily to Jewish Christians because at the time the persecution that they were facing, they weren't as concerned about what the Gentiles did. But it was a time of Jewish persecution for people who had become Christians and had been driven out of Jerusalem because at the time of the stoning of the deacon Stephen, uh, that began a time of great persecution. It's recorded, the story of that is recorded in Acts 6 through 8. In Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, it says, At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, at the time Stephen was stoned, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So James is writing to Christians who are escaping imprisonment by leaving their homes, fleeing their homes and their jobs uh, to get away from persecution in Jerusalem. They're now facing the biggest crises in their entire life, living as refugees in constant fear of arrest and persecution. And that's why this short book in the New Testament has so much to say to us as we face the COVID-19 crisis and every other crisis that we're going to face in life. How can James help his struggling church members, which are now refugees? He knows that if they're going to make it through successfully this very terrible storm, that they're going to have to have a bigger perspective. They're going to have to see life from God's perspective. They have to have a strong biblical Christian worldview. Our worldview is the lens through which we see and interpret life. If you look at life <clears throat> with a humanistic worldview, if you're thinking this life is all there is, life is all about me and getting the things I want, but I'm facing life alone, then big crises are going to create a terrible panic in your life. But if you see life through a Christian worldview that reminds you God is with us, Christ loves you so much he died for you, this world is not all there is, God is ultimately in control, and this life is about preparing for eternity as we learn to give and grow rather than get, then you can have peace instead of panic in your life as you face all of life's circumstances. James knows to have that kind of a biblical, godly worldview, it's essential that his church members ask God for his wisdom. Now, wisdom is not just having knowledge or information. It's the ability to apply that knowledge correctly to all of life's circumstances. So James begs his church members to go to God fervently in prayer and ask God to give them wisdom, his eternal perspective, the spiritual insight and understanding to know that God is in control no matter how things may appear at the moment, and God is working out his plans and purposes in their lives and in the world around them. 
Their circumstances, like our circumstances today, are unexpected, but the outcome is not unsure. James calls his brothers and Christians in Christ to per fervently pray for faith and wisdom because without them, he says in verses 6 and 8, we are like waves on the sea driven helplessly back and forth by the winds. <clears throat> like little boats with no anchor in a storm tossed about by the waves of stress and anxiety, unstable mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, and in every other way. And even worse, in verse 7, James says, being double-minded, being torn between a Christian worldview of faith and a secular worldview that, that, that says there is no God and we're on our own, assures that our prayers won't be answered. James writes in chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask with faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is, double -mind, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways." Now, in our passage today, James gives us the problem, then he gives us the prescription, a wonderful promise from God, and finally, a very practical application. The problem, he says, is being double-minded. James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is an un unstable in all his ways. In the Greek, the word double-minded literally means two-souled pulled apart in different directions, divided loyalties, divided priorities. James actually makes up this word, but we've all felt that way. The problem expresses itself as indecision. We can't decide what to believe or what to do. We vacillate between feelings of hope and feelings of despair. Double-mindedness means trying to decide if I want to follow my will or God's will. It means I vacillate between there is a God who's caring for me and at other times doubting whether God even exists. And unfortunately, that's exactly where many American Christians are today. They haven't nurtured their faith and learned to trust God day by day. And so when a storm like COVID-19 comes, there's not a lot to hang on to. Double-mindedness double is devastating and it's debilitating. It makes you unstable in every area of life, James says. The word translated here as unstable is translated in other places in the Bible as confused. It's a word that's used to describe a drunk who's staggering and reeling as he walks, barely able to stand. James is saying if you can't make up your mind about whether you really believe God's many promises in the Bible... Uh, for those who are going to trust him, if, if you're, you're, you're wavering back and forth, you know, about do I have faith or do I not have faith, you're going to be unstable in life. All your ways will be unstable, he says. You'll be in constant turmoil. Now, there are three ways indecision, double-mindedness double makes you unstable. First, you're unstable emotionally. It's a real strain if you're not sure about God and His promised care, or if you don't even think about God's love and care when problems come into your life. Then you're worried and confused. You can't sleep. You feel overwhelmed as you try to deal with this overwhelming problem all by yourself. Depression may begin to set in. You're asking yourself, what's going to happen to me? I'm afraid because of what's going on that I won't be able to achieve the things I want to achieve and get the things I want and do the things I want. That it creates emotional instability that affects everything you think, say, and do. Some people start drinking too much. Some take drugs to deal with the stress and the anxiety. One of the fathers of modern-day psychology, William James, says, the most miserable person in the world is the person who is habitually indecisive. Being spiritually indecisive and unsure leads to unstable emotions, which results in unstable relationships. When you are internally frayed and upset, it affects the way you talk to, the way you interact with all the people around you, your husband, your wife, your kids, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, you are on edge. Some people lash out and there's increased conflict. Other people respond by shutting down. They clam up, they withdraw into themselves. Either way, you're emotionally unapproachable. 
Some people begin to think, maybe my family is better off without me. Maybe I need to quit my job, retire early to get away from the people I work with. Maybe I need to get a divorce. As the stress, anxiety, and internal and external conflict gets worse and worse, even people who haven't thought much about God in years often re-examine their beliefs about God. But you can't find the peace of God with half your brain holding on to a humanistic worldview and the other half half-heartedly believing in a God you're not sure is really even there and whose values you've never been willing to completely commit yourself to. Your double-mindedness leads you to have an unproductive prayer life, James says. In verse 7, that man will not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. In other words, your unbelief blocks your prayers. Double-mindedness, a lack of faith, keeps God from being able to give you and keeps you from being able to receive the peace and the strength that God has to offer. Some of you may say, well, why doesn't God ever answer my prayers? Well, maybe because you've never really decided whether you're really going to trust your whole life to God, whether you want to live your life God's way or your way in the world's way. Double-mindedness can lead you to live a double life, a spiritual schizophrenia, a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of life. In Pilgrim's Progress, it talks about a man named Mr. Facing Both Ways. And that's what James is talking about. People who are trying to face both ways. That's when you want to live for the world's values, for money, for pleasure, and for things. But you also want to have all the blessings and peace that comes from living according to God's values. Double-mindedness is when you know what's right, but you do what's wrong anyway. When you're trying to live as two people on Sunday, you come and sing Onward Christian Soldiers, but on Monday you go AWOL and you look and act like all the people around you who don't even have any faith at all. Double-mindedness produces a double life. It causes instability in all your ways. It produces an unstable lifestyle. So what's James' prescription? What's the solution? James says, get God's wisdom. James 1, 5, and 6 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And J James gives us three practical steps. You admit, you ask, and you anticipate. First, you admit your need. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom. I think there's a little sarcasm in that statement. All of us need God's wisdom. James is saying, if any of you is willing to admit that you don't have it all together. James is the book of wisdom in the New Testament, like Proverbs is the book of wisdom in the Old Testament. We all lack wisdom. It's universal. Wisdom is different from knowledge. Wisdom is knowledge put into practice. Wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. Wisdom is making decisions the way God would make decisions. The word wisdom in Greek is the word Sophia. Phila, Sophia equals philosophy, the love of wisdom. Wisdom means having the ability to practically apply truth to the experiences of life. The Bible talks a lot about wisdom, but all most of the world is interested in is knowledge. The world says that education, the acquisition of knowledge, is the key to a better life and a better world. The world is very interested and impressed with knowledge. God is impressed with wisdom. Where do you find truth? And what do you do with the knowledge of the truth once you have it? Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Pride blocks wisdom. You can't learn anything if you think you already know it all. One of the reasons why we never learn wisdom is we feel like we've got it all together, that we don't really need God. When I pastored First Baptist Church Clarendon, that's now called the Church at Clarendon, I learned that Arlington County has more PhDs living in that county than any other county in Virginia. It also has the lowest per capita rate of church attendance. In other words, on Sunday morning per capita, there are fewer people attending church in Arlington County than any other county in the state of Virginia. Why is that? Because most of those very well-educated people think that they already know it all. They don't need God's truth. James is saying admission of the lack of wisdom, a lack of knowledge of God's truth, is the beginning of having God's wisdom. You have to be willing to admit, I don't have it all together. I don't have all the answers. 
I need God's truth and not God's perspective. Now, for some of you, that may be very hard. How long has it been since you've said to your husband or wife or anyone else, I was wrong? That's a practical indicator of whether you realize that you don't know it all. You don't, you're not always right. You don't always have the right perspective. That's realizing you need God's wisdom. The admission of lack of wisdom is the beginning of wisdom. So James says it starts, you admit your need. Then you ask, ask for wisdom. You pray to God. You talk to him about the situation, the circumstance, the crisis you're facing. James says if any man lacks wisdom, he should ask God. How do you get wisdom? By listening to Dr. Phil, by reading the New York Times, by watching TV, by getting another degree. The Bible says you get wisdom by asking God. That's where true wisdom comes from, from God. So you talk to God about what's going on in your life and you ask for his wisdom. Proverbs 2, 6 says, It is the Lord who gives wisdom. From him come knowledge and understanding. If God were to come to you one day and say to you, I'm going to give you one request. You can ask for anything in the whole world. What would you ask for? In the Old Testament, that's exactly what God did. God came to the young King Solomon and he said to, them, said to him, you're the king of Israel. I'm going to grant you one request. What do you want more than anything else in your life? Solomon thought it over. He said, he, he said I'm so inadequate. I don't know how to correctly lead all these people. More than anything else, God, I want wisdom. I want to be able to think the way you think, to see things from your point of view, to make decisions the way that you make them. I don't want to make mistakes. I don't want to look back on my life later and have all kinds of regrets. I want wisdom. The Bible says that God was pleased with that request. He granted it to him, just like God always gives wisdom to those that ask him for it. He said, Solomon... Because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you not only wisdom, but all the things that most people would ask for, wealth and fame and a long life. So Solomon not only became the wisest man, but he was also one of the wealth, wealthiest men of the world of his day. He, he, was, he was a very famous person with a worldwide reputation, and he lived a long life. Now, if God came to you and said, what do you want in life more than anything else? If you could have one request from God, what would you ask for? Would you ask for wisdom? James says you should. That's how important wisdom is. Proverbs says if you don't get anything else, get wisdom. The reason we don't have wisdom is we don't ask. James 4.2 says you have not because you ask not. 20 times in the New Testament, it says for us to ask. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given unto you. The, the, this word in Greek literally means keep on asking, be persistent. Are you asking God to give you wisdom and perspective as you face this COVID-19 crisis, as you face all the problems of life? Finally, James says the third step to receiving wisdom from God is to anticipate an answer in faith. James writes, when you pray, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Circle that, not doubt. If you want wisdom, first you've got to ask the right person. You've got to ask God. And then you've got to ask in the right way. You've got to ask in faith, believing, not doubting. That means the key to receiving God's wisdom is prayer and the condition for receiving it is faith. Have you ever prayed a prayer and then later thought to yourself, I know I probably am not going to get what I prayed for. Well, you set yourself up. God says, if you can't believe you're going to get an answer from me, don't even waste time praying. Pray in faith, believing, the Bible says, thanking God in advance that he's going to give you the right answer at the right time. Doubt is debilitating. It hinders God from working in your life and prevents you from finding God's peace and strength when you need it the most. Remember Jesus at Nazareth, at Nazareth what the Bible says? It says he could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Remember Peter. Peter's in the boat one day. It's at night and Jesus comes to his disciples walking on the water. And Peter asked Jesus if he can come to him on the water. And when Jesus says yes, Peter jumps out of the boat and he starts walking toward the Lord. Now, if I was preaching a sermon on this passage, the first thing I would tell you is if you want to walk on the water, you've got to be willing to get out of the boat. 
You've got to take risk in life if you're going to live by faith. It doesn't require any faith to stay in the boat. You've got to jump out of the boat and believe that if God is leading you, that he's going to take care of you. But that's another sermon. What I want you to see today is Peter starts walking across the water in the midst of in the midst of the choppy waves, and at first, he's doing fine. He's got his eyes on Jesus. But then Peter looks down at the waves around him. He takes his focus off Jesus, and he begins instantly to sink. The moment you get your eyes off the Lord and onto the circumstances, you're going to sink too. Some of you feel right now like you're sinking, and the reason is because you're focusing on all the problems instead of focusing on Jesus Christ and his love and power. The reason you're so filled with worry and anxiety is you're saying to yourself, this is a giant problem. How can I ever solve it? It's absolutely impossible. Well, God specializes in the impossible. The Bible says twice, nothing is impossible with God. Get your eyes off the problem and get your eyes on the Lord. If you have your eyes on the problem, you're going to sink. You must believe and not doubt. James says, he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. A lot of Christians are like corks in the ocean blown around back and forth. They're victims of their circumstances. Instead of being on top of the circumstances, the circumstances are on top of them. Some of you are blown away right now because you haven't been asking for wisdom, for God's perspective on the situation. Go to God in prayer and do it in faith with the commitment in advance that you're going to trust God and you're going to follow his will and his way no matter where he leads. And he will miraculously lead you through the storm. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to him must believe, circle that, must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If you want to receive anything from God, you've got to believe and in advance commit yourself to handling the problem God's way because you know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's faith. Thank God in advance that he's got it all under control and decide in advance that you're going to trust him to take care of everything. And then there's the wonderful promise that God will give it. James says, if any man lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. God wants to give you wisdom. He's eager, just like it pleased God when Solomon asked for wisdom. It pleases God when you come to him and say, I don't have any idea about how I'm going to make it through all this. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Ask God, and his promise is, is that he will give you the wisdom and everything else you need to deal with whatever situation you're facing. And look at how God says he'll give wisdom. He gives it continually. James says, ask God who gives. In the Greek, the gives is a present active indicative uh, form. That means God is continuously giving. He keeps on giving. He doesn't run out of desire. He doesn't run out of energy or resources. Secondly, James says he gives generously. His resources are unlimited. He has enough for everyone. He isn't selfish in giving his resources out. God is waiting to do, as Ephesians 3.20 says, exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that you can ask or even imagine. God gives generously, and God gives without finding fault. God is not critical or bothered by you coming and asking him for what you need. God gives cheerfully and generously. Have you ever received a gift from someone who didn't really want to give it to you, but they just felt like they had to? Isn't that awkward? Isn't that a miserable experience? But that's not the way God, God gives. God can't wait to give you everything you need when you come to him in faith and ask for it, especially his perspective on what you're facing and his wisdom on how you should deal with it. And then James gives us a very practical and important application of all that he's taught us up to this point. The number one question most people have when a crisis comes, as soon as they know their own life is out of jeopardy, their question is, what, of all, what does all this mean for my financial situation? James's first application of what it means to get God's wisdom and perspective on life deals with money and material things. Why? Well, for the same reason Jesus talks so much about material things. It's the number one idolatry, the number one worldly de delusion that we struggle with and that often defeats us. Most of the Christians in the early church were poor. Being driven out of Jerusalem away from their homes and jobs was a huge emotional disaster. But it was even more of a financial disaster. 
just as COVID-19 in the long run is going to be more of a financial crisis for most Americans than a health crisis. We already know 98 to 99 percent of all those who get COVID-19 are going to completely recover. So while we should take every precaution, especially for those over 65 and those with underlying conditions, we also need to have perspective. The health crisis is real and it's bad, but when the health crisis is gone for at least half of this country, this will continue to be a major financial crisis. Some jobs will permanently be lost. Some businesses will permanently close. Some people, many people perhaps, financial health will never fully recover. How does James tell his people receiving God's wisdom and God's perspective their new spiritual understanding of life should affect their feelings about their financial circumstances? Well, James writes in verses 9 through 11, Let the lowly brother, and James is talking about the poor, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Now remember, James is trying to teach his people to go to God and ask them to give them wisdom, a godly, truly Christian worldview. Why? Well, so that they can see their current circumstances in the right perspective in light of not only time, but also eternity. They need to ask themselves, is life all about what I can get out of it, what's in it for me? Or is it about learning and growing and preparing for eternity with God? What James tells Christians is they should glory, verse 9, in what they possess in Jesus Christ, not in their earthly possessions because wealth and material things don't last. By contrast, those who are trusting in their wealth, whom James calls the rich, will ultimately be humiliated, it says in verse 10, because all their riches and worldly pursuits that they've built their whole life on, spent their whole life pursuing, those are going to quickly fade away just like the grass and the flowers of the field. Now, this is a message that most materialistic Americans don't want to hear. But James says in a relatively short time, we're all going to die and we're going to leave this world. And whatever we have or whatever we've achieved in the eyes of the world is quickly forgotten. We can't take any of our wealth or worldly achievements with us beyond the grave. But an eternal perspective, a Christian worldview, reminds us that what we possess as co-heirs with Jesus Christ is much more valuable than worldly wealth and achievement because they're so temporary. But what God offers us is eternal. James isn't saying wealth is wrong. He's just reminding us that it, it is at best a tool God has placed in our hands to do good. And at worst, it's a terrible distraction that consume us and can cause us to ignore God and his plans for our lives and lead us to waste our lives and be unprepared for eternity. But only those who have God's wisdom can see, accept, appreciate, and live their lives in light of this truth. So let's summarize. James says the problem that keeps us from finding God's strength and peace for every circumstance and every crisis of life is double-mindedness. James points to the symptoms of double-mindedness that we see in our lives, indecision and inner turmoil. And then he tells us the root of the problem is we failed to ask for God's wisdom, the perspective of truth and faith that gives us a true understanding of life, a Christian worldview. James' caution is don't let doubt derail you. God wants to give you his wisdom and insight into his perspective and ways so that your faith will be strengthened and we'll see that the things we fear losing the most, worldly treasures and achievements and even our own lives, are not the most important things. The most important things that can never be taken away from us are the spiritual things. The world was created from nothing, and ultimately the, the, the Bible says that, you know, that the world that we know is going to disappear. God's going to roll it up and create a new heaven and a new earth. What seems so real to us is not the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is God and what existed before he created all of this out of nothing. 
You see, the message of Easter is not only that we've been forgiven all of our sins, but also that we've been delivered from darkness and given God's light of truth and wisdom that gives us victory over the false values and the delusions of this world so we can be free from despair. As Romans 8, 28 says, God really is working all things together for our good, whether we can see it at the moment or not. As Philippians 4.19 says, God really will meet all our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. But if we don't accept the victory and hold on to it by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit, then we're always going to feel defeated by the temporary problems and crises of life. James calls for us to have faith as we seek fervently through prayer God's wisdom and God's strength. So he can lead us out of, a, out of despair and defeat and into the glorious victory of the sons of God. Now, if all of that sounds too complicated, Jesus made it very simple when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. In other words, everything else will fall into place. This is the one great decision that you have to make to find God's peace and wisdom and strength and joy in the midst of every situation and even in the midst of crises in life. The question is, will you finally decide to do that, to really put Jesus Christ and his values first? Will you leave the world's values and your plans behind because now you're seeking God's values and God's plan and trusting Him alone to meet all your needs? That is the decision that frees you from fear and worry and anxiety and leads us to experience the wonderful victory of the Son of God in our lives day by day, beginning right now and going right into eternity. So the question is, what will you decide? Will you seek and accept God's wisdom, God's perspective? God's peace and God's power is the prize for those who choose to put Jesus Christ and seeking his kingdom first. Would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we are so easily deceived because the things around us, the things we can touch and taste and see, they seem so real to us. And yet, Father, you tell us in, in your word that there is a greater reality, a greater reality than the temporary reality of this world that we'll only live in 70, 80, 90, 100 years. But then there are the uncountable trillions and trillions of years of eternity. Father, I pray that you would help us to pray fervently for your wisdom and for your faith. Father, to know your truth that sets us free in order that we might be the people that you've called us to be in order that we might experience the victory that you intend for us to have in Jesus Christ. That can't happen if we're double-minded. If we can't decide whether we're going to commit ourselves to the values of the world and the plans of the world, our plans, and, and, and the, uh, uh, the things that the world says are important, are we going to commit ourselves to Jesus Christ and the things that he says are important and are eternal? Father, by your grace, give us your wisdom and your faith in order that we might experience your victory through Jesus Christ our Lord in whom we pray. Amen.